Harry, Ron, and Hermione are known as the Golden Trio, as they are the iconic characters which the entire Harry Potter series revolves around. But during their first year at Hogwarts, it takes a decent amount of time for these three students to form the bond that will carry them through the rest of the books. And during this formative time before an official Golden Trio is established, there's another student who is in the running as potentially the fourth member of this friend group. But the movie completely disregards this character. Who is it? none other than Neville Longbottom. Of course, at the end of the movie, Neville gets the final points that bring Gryffindor the House Cup, but in the books, he plays a much larger role than that small moment. For example, the movie completely cuts him out of the Golden Trio's most critical moments so far in the story. Harry and Ron's first time meeting Hermione? Neville was there. Harry's first potions class where he meets Snape? Neville plays a crucial role, which you can learn more about in last week's episode. And this week, Neville is with Harry, Ron, and Hermione during their first near-death experience with a three-headed dog. My name is Gibby, and welcome back to episode 8 of Movies vs. Manuscripts Harry Potter Edition. This is the show where I take J.K. Rowling's iconic Harry Potter series and compare the books to their film counterparts to spot every single change made scene by scene. Today, we are diving into Harry's first flying lesson and the trio's encounter with Fluffy, the three-headed dog. But most importantly, today I will be revealing the fourth member of the trio who somehow got erased from these critical scenes. We will reveal how Neville actually got injured during their first flying lesson, how Harry actually got onto the Gryffindor Quidditch team, and of course how these four first years found their way into the forbidden third floor at midnight in their pajamas. Trust me, there's a lot to cover. Also, shout out to this commenter who shared the amazing fun fact that they did actually cast in film scenes with Peeves, but eventually cut them all from the film. Each week, I'll be showcasing one of my favorite comments from a previous episode, which could be a fun fact, a correction, or just anything that's worth sharing. So once you finish the video, comment your thoughts below, and you might be featured in the next video. As always, I'll cover all of these changes across four categories, which are characters, timeline, location, and plot. But before we jump into all the differences, let's do a quick refresher on what happens in these scenes in the movie. To start, we can pick up from where we left off last week, which kind of dipped into this week's first scene. You see, the movie jumbles things around a little bit, so we need to look at this overlapping scene of their mail delivery in the Great Hall to get context for the next scene, which is the flying lesson. We see all of the students in the Great Hall one day, right before the mail comes, and Seamus blows up his drink after trying to turn it into rum. Then, once the mail arrives, Neville gets a remembrall from his grandma. Then, of course, Harry takes Ron's Daily Profit paper and sees the article about Gringotts, which we covered last week. The important thing to remember about this scene is that Neville receives his Remembrall in the mail, which is crucial to know once we get to the plot changes. The movie then cuts to the outside lawn of Hogwarts as two lines of first years are seen about to have their first flying lesson. We see the Slytherins and the Gryffindors and Madame Hooch, who will be teaching them. She gives them brief instructions on what to do in order to get their broom to fly, but as she blows her whistle, Neville loses control of his broom and goes on a massive roller coaster of a ride around the castle, ultimately getting caught on a high up statue and then dropping to the ground and breaking his wrist. After this, Madame Hooch tells them to all stay on the ground as she takes Neville to the hospital wing. Draco finds Neville's remember all on the ground, and after Harry tells him to hand it over, Draco says that he's going to leave it on the roof for Neville to find. Both of the boys take off into the air, and after Harry threatens to knock Draco off of his broom, Draco throws the ball far into the distance, and Harry goes darting after it. He catches the ball in spectacular fashion that frankly defies physics, and McGonagall sees him through her office window. After landing, McGonagall comes toward the group of cheering first years and takes Harry inside. Harry thinks he's getting expelled, but to his surprise, McGonagall introduces Harry to Oliver Wood, captain of the Quidditch team, and she proclaims that Harry is the new Gryffindor seeker. We then see Harry and Ron walking through the halls and discussing this amazing achievement, as Harry is the youngest Quidditch player in a hundred years. He's nervous about this new role, but Hermione boosts his confidence by showing him a trophy case that has his father's name on it as Gryffindor Seeker. The trio then makes their way back to Gryffindor Tower, but gets lost as the staircase suddenly moves as they are on it. They head into the corridor where the stairs shifted, and after entering, they realize that they're in the forbidden third floor corridor, and go to leave but are trapped by Mrs. Norris. Filch's cat. They then run away as they know Filch will be close behind the cat, and after Hermione performs a spell to unlock a door at the end of the corridor, they enter the room to hide. They have a brief moment of relief as they have just narrowly escaped Filch, but as they turn around to look into the room, they realized why the door was locked. 
a massive three-headed dog, who we know as Fluffy, is waking up in front of them and isn't happy that they're there. They quickly escape the door, almost being eaten in the process, and then head back to Gryffindor Tower. Upon arrival in their common room, Hermione tells the boys that she noticed the dog was guarding a trap door in the room, and then goes to sleep before they can think of another way to get them killed, or worse, expelled. And that is where our scenes end for this week. I know this week they are a little longer than usual, but that's because both of these scenes correspond to one chapter in the book, which is called Midnight Duel. You're probably thinking, why in the world is this chapter called Midnight Duel? There's no sign of a duel or it being midnight in these scenes. Well, just wait until we get to the plot changes, as Neville's involvement in this chapter wasn't the only thing removed from these scenes, but Draco also might have challenged Harry to a wizard duel. Before we get to that though, we need to go through our character, timeline, and location changes. First, as for characters, we have just a couple of omissions. The key characters that are included in these scenes are the Golden Trio, Madame Hooch, McGonagall, Neville, Draco, Filch, and then the rest of the classmates. As for characters who have key speaking roles in the book, but are removed from the movie, we've got Pavardi Patel, Pansy Parkinson, and most importantly, Peeves. If you've been watching the previous episodes of this series, you're probably coming to understand what I meant a couple episodes ago when I said that it's crazy that they removed Peeves, as I'm pretty sure so far he has had a crucial role in each chapter since his introduction, and this week he is one of the main reasons that they almost get eaten by a giant three-headed dog. Now for timeline changes, there's just one major change, which is that they accidentally find the forbidden third floor corridor at you guessed it, midnight. They are even in their nighttime bathrobes during this moment, unlike in the movie when they still have their school uniforms on. Lastly, before we get to the plot changes, we have one location difference, which is the Hogwarts trophy room. Before they run from Filch and find themselves in Fluffy's room, they first go to the trophy room for a very specific reason, which I won't get into right now because we'll cover that in the next section. Speaking of which, I think it's time that we jump into the plot changes for these scenes. Hang in there because there are quite a few. Some large, some small, but you know the deal, it's my job to uncover every change I find. If you're looking to dive into the wizarding world in a whole new way, I highly encourage you to try out Audible and experience the Harry Potter series through the audiobooks. I have found this a super cool way to relive my favorite Harry Potter moments, and if you use my link in the description, you can claim your free trial on Audible, which gets you one free audiobook of your choice. If you want to follow along with me each week as I do this series, go ahead and grab your free copy of The Philosopher's Stone. Plus, it supports the channel at the same time, so it's a win win. Alright, let's get into the changes. The first change is that Seamus doesn't blow up his drink like they show in this scene. In fact, Seamus really doesn't blow up much in the whole series, although he does occasionally catch things on fire. I think for comedic purposes, they switch it to these quick explosions, which I'm not complaining about. Next, when Neville receives his Remembrall, he actually gets harassed by Draco, Crab, and Goyle right there. Draco comes up behind him and snatches the ball out of his hands, causing Harry and Ron to stand up ready to fight, as they already hate Draco. But McGonagall quickly spots the trouble brewing and walks over to have Draco give Neville back his ball. Next, during the flying lesson, Ron's broom doesn't hit him in the face, although this is a funny moment in the movie, so I don't mind it. Also, when it comes to Neville's involvement in the flying lesson, there are a couple changes. First, Neville accidentally kicks off the ground before Madame Hooch even blows her whistle in the book. Second, he doesn't zoom around the lawn in the castle like he's on a roller coaster. It's actually a lot more realistic than that. All he does is kick a little too hard off the ground and shoot up about 20 feet in the air. Then he falls off the broom and falls straight back down to the ground. It is a much more entertaining version in the movie, but extremely unrealistic. Next, after Madame Hooch takes Neville away, Draco makes fun of him and Pavardi Patel defends him. This causes Pansy Parkinson to then take Draco's side and make fun of Pavardi for standing up for Neville. In the movie, in order to keep the focus on Harry, they cut out these extra characters speaking, but in the book it helps round out the rest of the classmates as more than voiceless NPCs. Next, Draco threatens to leave Neville's Remembrall up a tree, not on the roof. Also, after Draco throws the ball, Harry does a nosedive and then catches the ball while tumbling to the ground. In the movie, they show him zooming after it and catching the ball in the air in front of McGonagall's office. Plus, after McGonagall comes out in the book, she is a lot more heated and is near yelling at Harry for doing something so dangerous. Ron and Pavardi try to explain to McGonagall that it was Draco's fault, but she won't have any of it, and she takes Harry inside. In the movie, she comes out and gets him without really saying anything, and Ron and Pavardi don't do anything to defend Harry. Another small change is that Oliver Wood was technically in Charm's class when McGonagall brings Harry to him, but the movie shows him in Defense Against the Dark Arts. Next, McGonagall takes Oliver and Harry to an empty classroom before talking to them. 
After entering the room, the only other person in there is Peeves, who is busy writing rude words on the chalkboard. Remember, this is part of what differentiates Peeves from other ghosts and why he is such a prankster, as since he is a poltergeist, he is able to take physical form and grab things like chalk. McGonagall tells Peeves to leave, and then she introduces the two boys in the room, not outside the classroom like shown in the movie. Also, McGonagall's conversation with Wood is a lot longer in the books. She talks about how they can bend the first year rule because the Gryffindor team needs to be better and win this year. She recalls how they were flattened in their last match and that she wasn't able to look Snape in the eyes for weeks. Wood also says that Harry will need a broom like a Nimbus 2000, which of course we know he gets later on. Plus, another small change in regards to this conversation is that McGonagall mentions that Harry's father would have been proud and that he was an excellent Quidditch player too. In the movie, they swap this moment out for when Hermione shows Harry the Quidditch trophy case. Also, according to J.K. Rowling, Harry's dad was a chaser, not a seeker, but I get that emotionally it makes more sense in the movie to have his father be a seeker so that Harry has something in common with him. By the way, a quick aside here and another change that kind of goes into all of the episodes that I'm going to be doing is the ages of the characters, specifically Harry's parents and Snape. In the movie, they show Snape as being much older, but technically Harry's parents would have been in their early 20s when they had him and Snape was in their class. So I know a lot of you have pointed it out in the comments and I just wanted to mention it quickly here that Snape really should have been in his 30s not his 50s like they show in the movie. Next, McGonagall instructs Harry to keep his new position on the Quidditch team a secret, but in the movie the whole school knows immediately. We overhear the ghosts floating through the halls talking about it and can easily assume that if they're openly talking about it then the students know as well. On top of that, Ron and Harry are talking about it quite loudly in the halls, so I doubt it was a secret. Speaking of them talking about it, that is also changed. They don't discuss Harry's new position in the halls, but rather in the Great Hall during dinner. After Harry tells Ron, Ron is shocked and amazed, and Fred and George come over to congratulate Harry as they are on the team as well and were told by Wood that Harry had joined. It's during this dinner in the Great Hall that our next most important plot change happens, which explains the title of the chapter that I mentioned earlier, The Midnight Duel. You see, after Fred and George leave Ron and Harry at the dinner table, Draco comes up with Crabbe and Goyle and asks when Harry is leaving the school to go back to the Muggles. At this point, because Harry's role on the Quidditch team is a secret, Draco thinks that Harry got punished by McGonagall when she took him from the flying lesson. In Draco's mind, he succeeded in getting Harry in trouble. After Draco's comment, Harry says that Draco is a lot braver now that he's on the ground with his little friends. Draco then says that he could take Harry on alone anytime and suggests that they have a wizard's duel at midnight. He asks Harry if he has even heard of what a wizard's duel is, which of course he hasn't, but Ron steps in and says that he has and that Ron will be Harry's second. Draco says that Crab will be his second and then says to meet him in the trophy room at midnight and then Draco and his goons leave. Harry then asks Ron what a wizard's duel is and what a second is and Ron says that he's his second just in case Harry dies. But after seeing the look on Harry's face, he quickly mentions how that only happens in real duels and that Draco probably expected Harry to refuse as neither of them know enough magic to really do any damage. Ron also suggests to just punch Draco in the nose if Harry can't perform any spells. Hermione then comes up as she has overheard the entire conversation and she tells Harry that he can't go to the duel because he'll get more points taken away from Gryffindor. It is key to remember that just like in the movie, the Golden Trio really isn't solidified yet. In fact, Harry and Ron quite dislike Hermione as she is constantly sticking her nose where it doesn't belong and acts like a know-it-all. Harry even tells her off and says that it's none of her business when she tells him not to go to the wizard's duel with Draco. And speaking of the wizard's duel, that actually plays perfectly into the next change. You see, since the idea of the duel was removed for the film, they needed a way to get the trio into the Forbidden Corridor. All they did in the movie was have Hermione show Harry and Ron the Quidditch trophy case and then they get lost in the moving staircases as they head to the Gryffindor Tower. But in the book, it is a lot more orchestrated than that happy accident. Plus, Neville is with them for the whole thing. So here's the context. When it comes time for the wizard's duel at midnight with Draco, Harry and Ron head out of the portrait hole and are followed by an angry Hermione who is trying to get Harry not to go. After Hermione realizes that there's no way she can convince them otherwise, she goes back to head back inside the Gryffindor Tower, only to find that the fat lady in the portrait has gone for a midnight stroll and so she can't get back inside the Gryffindor common room. Then, as they're leaving the tower, they spot Neville asleep outside the portrait hole as well. He wakes up and says that he got stuck outside because he forgot the password. Harry and Ron tell him the password, but then mention that he can't get inside now because the fat lady has left the portrait. This means that, much to the dismay of Ron and Harry, Hermione and Neville accompany them to this duel with Draco. Eventually, they make it to the trophy room, but after waiting around past midnight, they realize that Draco isn't going to show up. 
Then the worst happens when they hear Filchit's voice talking to Mrs. Norris, and Hermione realizes that Draco set Harry up by tipping Filch off on where some students might be out of bed past curfew. At this point, Draco is determined to get Harry expelled, it seems. They try to hide it, but Neville and Ron trip over each other in the dark and crash into a suit of armor, which was loud enough to wake up the whole castle. After this, the four of them sprint away from the trophy room to escape Filch. Eventually, as they're trying to get back to Gryffindor Tower, they run into Peeves, who starts yelling, students out of bed, students out of bed. This causes Filch to come running, and Hermione uses her charm to unlock the nearest door so that they can hide. They hear outside the door as Peeves taunts Filch and doesn't tell him where the four students went, which is classic Peeves being on nobody's team. After they hear Filch and Peeves leave, Neville tugs on Harry's sleeve, and Harry tells him to get off, but then realizes what is happening as he turns around and sees a massive three-headed dog staring at them. Then, for the final plot change, the four first years escape the room before it even starts biting at them. The movie shows them putting up a struggle and nearly getting eaten, but they leave the room before the dog even has a chance to do that in the book. Then they run all the way back to the Gryffindor Tower, and the movie stays pretty true to what the book says from that point on, except for the fact that Neville is completely missing. And that wraps up all the changes for this week's episode. I'm curious to know what you think about the movie's version of these events. Do you think that they should have included Neville more in the films like what it says in the books? Or do you think that it was for the best that they cut down his role significantly in the first movie? As always, be sure to check out all the previous episodes you might have missed and like and subscribe to stay tuned for next week's episode. Have a great week and I'll see you in the next episode.